I think we're live now. Oh, wow. You're way up north. Cool. Um, it's gorgeous up there. Well, uh, hello. Good morning and good evening, as the case may be. Um, <laughs> how's it going, Johnny? Pretty good. How are you, Jack? Good, man. Um, so I think we're here to talk Prop 56. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of people need to learn what it's really about. And I mean, it's pretty much guaranteed to pass already. <laughs> yes, but, it is. Uh, but I think people should probably know what it's about. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, this is, I think, especially with anything IBC related, it's often confusing. It's kind of hard for folks to kind of understand what the real implications of things like this are. And it's, uh, it can be difficult to understand how this might be used or who the, who the clients are. So I'm really looking forward to kind of answering any and all questions from folks. Uh, so uh, this is a Q&A and I, Johnny and I are going to chat for a little while, but as questions build up. So please feel free to ask questions. Please, yeah. uh, please feel free to just chime in in any way. Exactly. Um, did you want to give a little um, little bit of a background on uh, Proposal 56 and like what kind of new features it's going to add to the hub? Yeah, absolutely. So. Uh, you know, I think that the overall framing that I have for Prop 56 is that it's a uh, makes the hub into an IVC packet router. And I think folks are kind of familiar with what a router does. We all have one in our home if we're if we've got Wi-Fi. Um, and what that router does is it brings in data from the internet and routes it to the various devices that you're connecting in your house. And in that same way, this allows the hub to act as a router for token transfers. So let's say you're over on, um, you know, Persistence One, and you want to get over to Akash to go buy some cloud compute. Um, this would enable the user over on Persistence One to send one transfer, and the packet would go through the hub over to Akash. And the huge benefit here is right now we're in this um, period of IBC where uh, every chain is kind of connecting to every other chain. It's this new network. Everyone's really excited. And uh, the issue with that is that if you're a new chain coming to join this network, in order to sort of participate in this, you need to run a lot of infrastructure. There's a lot of different nodes for these different chains that you need to run in order to enable these um, transfers across chain. And uh, there's uh, you know, a lot of relayer infrastructure that you need to do, including tokens for all those chains. And it gets really complicated. And right now with 10 to 12 networks, um, really major production ones available via IBC, that problem is small. But this problem is very quickly going to get a lot worse. <laughs> and especially yeah. Juno and Terra and a number of other major chains, hopefully Thorchain joining later this year, um, joining the IBC network. Um, you know, there's Omniflix. There's, uh, you know, a hand, the Pylon network is going to be launching. There's a handful of other chains that are sort of coming very soon. And as soon as that happens, this problem is really going to become critical. And if we don't have something on the hub, to help manage this, we're going to be in a position where the other chains within this ecosystem are going to figure this out for themselves, and they're not going to need the hub for this function. So I think the reason why I brought this proposal and the reason why I pushed so hard for this is because I think the time is now, and it is critical for us as the hub to uh, gain this market share and to start providing these interchain services. And at the top of the proposal, I actually quote the white paper, which I never do. Um, and there's a couple of selected quotes from the white paper. This has always been the intended use for the hub. Right. And this is something that, that I feel strongly about. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I think somebody already asked the first question. You mentioned that there would it would basically be a router. And they asked, uh, what happens if the router dies? Um, will there be another router to pick up the packet and send it or time out? It will time out. Um, but, you know, the router is the Cosmos hub. I think we have uh, some of the highest uptime uh, in all of the blockchains. Uh, well, that's a, it's a very broad and general statement. Um, the hub has extremely high uptime. And especially with the new upgrade module and Cosmovisor, upgrades are even going to take less and less downtime. 
So uh, the hub does have extremely high uptime. So the chances of the hub dying are very low. Also because the hub is an application specific blockchain, it is a much more simple piece of machinery than something larger and more generic, like a fully uh, smart contract based blockchain. Um, and for this reason, um, we foresee high uptime for the hub. So uh, in the event where the hub dies, those packets would time out as they are unable to be relayed. Gotcha. Do you see this um, creating some kind of implication or some kind of, uh, would it create an effect for platforms that already exist like Osmosis, Emerus, Kepler? Like yeah, you know, Emerus, so I, I've talked to Dogemos about this, and I believe Kepler will will try to support this feature for zones. And uh, like the way that this works just sort of relies on the way IBC infrastructure works. And really is, I mean, the initial implementation I did is like a 60 line parsing function. And then there's about 10 other lines of really critical code. So it's an extremely small surface area and just utilizes the existing IBC machinery. Um, if you wouldn't mind a little diversion, I'd like to kind of talk about how I originally thought of this feature. Would yeah, be? sure. Of course. Um, so uh, I think everyone's kind of seen the drama around the Gravity Bridge on Twitter. Right. And uh, there's a lot of discussion about credible neutrality, which I think has honestly been extremely healthy for the ecosystem in a lot of ways and has sussed out uh, a lot of things that, that I think folks were kind of unaware of. So. Um, just want to kind of say that that discussion has been good and helped a lot of people see other people within the ecosystem's uh, points of view, which is cool. Um, but one of the things that I thought is, okay, cool. Well, if we want the hub to be credibly neutral and we want to throw a gravity bridge on there, one way to do this would be able to en enable packet forwarding via IBC from Ethereum through the hub to any other zone that the hub is connected to. Mm -hmm. And I wrote that feature out in the gravity bridge and it was similarly very small. You can just reuse the existing transfer code and <laughs> grab those tokens that come over the bridge, shove them into an outgoing packet and like, bam. Um, so I coded that up and uh, built a little proof of concept. And I thought, hey, it would be real easy to do this in actual IBC too. And we could have that as a router. Imagine that. And I like mocked up a version of it and I was like, wow, this really works. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, went to a few different meetings and sort of got feedback from a large number of folks from the ecosystem, um, especially the IBC team. And, and I also uh, spoke with the Gaia team uh, and a couple of other uh, validators who are, you know, really closely followed this stuff. And I thought, wow, the time is now. We've got Terra joining IBC here. Um, there's going to be this explosion of new chains coming online towards the end of the year. And this is an excellent opportunity for the hub to gain market share in this, you know, not even existent yet field of uh, interchain services. And uh, so that was kind of the genesis of the feature. Perfect. That's, yeah, a really great explanation. Um... We actually have somebody that followed up with that, asking if there would be additional fee, would there be an additional fee cost for the user to use the hub as a router? This is a great question, Rodi, and thank you for asking it. Um, I think that, uh, so the implementation that I have takes a very, it takes a governance configurable percentage of the packet that travels through the hub. And I propose, in the governance uh, proposal, and I think initially we as the hub should set that fee to zero. Um, but over after six or eight months, if we see traction on this feature, I believe we should start charging for this because you know the hub validators are paying extra in compute, and this is a service that the hub offers. Um, and all that needs to be done to turn that fee on is for governance to vote for it. I think that that should be on the order of like a thousandth of a percent. Um, so a very, very small fee. And what the feature that I've shipped does is just takes that out of the packet. So the hub would receive a bunch of sort of various IBC denominations. And in the proposal, I say that uh, governance should delegate responsibility for those to a smaller group that would then go trade them for Atom and distribute them to Atom holders. 
And with the groups module, which is going to be coming on the hub early next year um, in an upgrade, uh, that will be very, very easy. And, uh, you know, we probably won't even uh, turn on the fee before that happens. So um, gives us a lot of time to kind of figure out how to manage that from a practical perspective. But the overall idea here is to allow the hub to profit from the growth of IBC in a very, very real way. You know, we as the hub have funded a lot of development of the fundamental technology that makes up the Cosmos stack. And a lot of that energy has kind of gone outwards into the ecosystem, which is great. You know, I just, it's one of the things that I love about this community is how engaged and active people are and how much we understand as a community that we need to build the ecosystem. But, you know, the time is now to start thinking about the hub, too. And, and this is it's sort of a first way to do that. Right. You're sort of like laying down some groundwork for some processes that the hub will be doing in the future. Yep. Gotcha. Um, should we should we follow that up with some of the questions here? It looks like. Oh, John, yeah, let's go. I'm ready. John D. Rapid fire, baby. Let's go. <laughs> Packet forwarding router seems like a good first step down the right path for accruing value for Atom holders. Do you foresee the Gravity Ducks moving to its own chain and other IBC services being provided in its place for delivering sustainable value for hub stakeholders? Yes. You know, uh, John D., uh, by the way, you're a sorcerer. Wonderful. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm a wizard, not a sorcerer personally, but uh, also respect sorcerers. Um, it, Yes, uh, your your comment is just spot on. There are this is the first of many IBC services that we can offer, and the reason I push this governance proposal now is because this is an incredibly easy one to write, and it is a very low risk thing for the hub to do to start testing this market, trying to gain market share there, and to understand the needs of users in that market. So this is going to stand us in really good stead to uh, you know be the first movers in this market and to ensure that we have a place there. Um, a second part of this question is, do you foresee the Gravity Dex moving to its own chain and other IBC services provided in its place for delivering sustainable value? Yes, I do. Um, between potentially the Gravity Bridge, which I don't know what the current state on that is. I do know that there are ongoing discussions with a number of folks about that. Um, to shared security, to staking derivatives, to interchain accounts. There are a number of major features on the roadmap that will drive value to Atom holders via these IPC services. And this is the first of many. Um, as far as the Gravity Dex moving to its own chain, um, that's a sort of broader debate that I think is slightly controversial. Um, but honestly, I, I do see a strong discussion for moving the Gravity Bridge to its own chain. Um, you know, giving it its own token distribution would enable it to uh, provide liquidity incentives. I think one of the hard parts about the Gravity Dex is a lot of the atoms are already distributed and it's very hard to find, you know, 20 to $50 million for marketing the Gravity Dex. <laughs> and there's not any atom holder with that amount of atom that's sort of willing to just blow it almost on giving it to a bunch of people. So, uh, you know, gravity with its own token distribution via shared security um, on the hub, I think is a good idea for a variety of reasons. You know, the purpose of the hub is to provide these interchain services. And I think a major reason why that's been sort of hard is we haven't had an interchain and like we have one now. So we need to start doing that. Thank you for the question, John D. Cool. Um, so it looks like we did have one more on the Q&A section. Uh, this one's about uh, IBC, I guess. Uh, what causes the most latency when using IBC with Osmosis and Emerus? Is it the relaying? Mm -hmm. What causes the most latency when using IBC with Osmosis and Emerus? Is it the relaying? Um, yes, long story short, it is the relaying. So just to sort of talk about in a real granular level, how IBC works. And um, Johnny, please like slow me down if I start getting too techy on folks um, and try to help me clarify this. Sure, yeah. But when you send a message transfer from Osmosis going to the hub, what happens is over on Osmosis in the IBC module, the chain queues up a packet. 
So think of a long chain and we're shoving packets in the back of it. In order for that packet to move over to the hub, we need to create a transaction on the hub with proofs from osmosis. And this is what the job of the relayer is. Um, so the amount of time it takes for a relayer to see and query for that packet and then submit the transaction over to the hub is how long that transaction takes to complete. Now, um, one of the big challenges for relaying between the hub and osmosis right now is osmosis has this event every day and it's called the epoch. And at the epoch, um, because of the massive amount of processing that's required for it right now, and I, I know the osmosis team is working hard on fixing this, um, that block takes like 10 to 15 minutes right now, which is kind of wild. Um, and during that 10 to 15 minutes, there is a disruption in the peer-to-peer -peer network for that network that can cause a lot of issues. And the disruption in this peer-to-peer -peer network slows down nodes connected to the network, often can take 20 to 30 minutes for the network to fully reconnect and for all of those nodes uh, to have the current state of the network. Um, and in addition, because there's a bunch of transactions that are kind of backed up, it takes a long time for new transactions to get included into the osmosis chain. And anything that relies on sort of cross-chain communication relies on this constant ping pong back and forth of transactions between both of the networks. And you can imagine with a huge disruption like that and a lot of traffic at the same time every day in a predictable fashion, yeah. um, it, it's really hard to get those transactions included in the osmosis chain. So this is honestly a good thing. We are stress testing the relayer software and getting to a point where we're really figuring out um, what the problems are. And, uh, you know, I would, so we're fixing that. I think that there's a lot of uh, progress on that relayer software. You know, the, the Go relayer has pushed out a new version. The Hermes team has been hard at work supporting new versions. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we'll, we'll substantially see a lot of that latency ironed out here in no time. So, uh, thank you, Voluntarius Soon. Very voluntary, <laughs> like that. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Cool. That was a great answer, actually. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, let's follow that up with, uh, is like to, to focus on proposal 56, if possible, there's quite yeah. a bit. Uh, is it necessary to convert the fees to Atom? So you were kind of talking about like how those fees would be processed. Um, the idea was that they would come through and then they would be deposited in the community pool, right? That's, that is the current implementation and what I'm planning on putting on the hub. That is sort of what I throw in the governance proposal and, and what the plan is, so yes. Gotcha, and a lot of that could be changed in the future, right? Well, yes, because we're, we're not shipping with a fee so like these uh, fees aren't going to start accruing and it's fairly easy to change where there's where those are going within the implementation as well. So, you know, this is something that could be subject to a future governance proposal. Gotcha. Uh, so Gustavo wants to know, um, is it necessary to convert the fees? Is it feasible for the fees to be deposited on each Atom holders account on Emirates with the option to be able to swap the Atom or to just keep the token received? That's a great question, Gustavo. The original implementation I had did deposit those fees directly into Atom Holders wallets. However, there's a huge issue with this. Um, we're talking about taking very, very small portions of packets in a large number of random denominations and distributing them. So uh, you can imagine that if we get like, let's say a hundredth of an Osmo, and then we have to split that across every staker of Atom in the <laughs> ecosystem. <laughs> Johnny's laughing because this is completely <laughs> absurd. Um, it would cause a lot of issues and leave people with a really subpar user experience and not making much money. Um, so for those reasons, I, I figured accumulating them in the community pool and then distributing them later is a good idea. Now, whether or not we convert them to Atom or not, I think is an open question, but we should, uh, you know, maybe have a discussion about that at the time that we turn the fees on. So the 
the governance proposal that turns on the fees should probably specify more about how those would be handled. But I don't really see a way around sort of collecting them and then periodically distributing them somehow because of that dust issue. Um, so that answer the question, Johnny? I, I think so, yeah. I mean, that's basically the gist of it is like the there would be such small fractions that it would be really difficult to distribute them. And then you can imagine how many transactions would go to every single atom staker. It would it would make like even following a wallet pretty difficult. Yes, it would also cause a tax nightmare for <laughs> right. everyone. Right. And I already have a huge tax nightmare. So like that was I, I you know, woke up in the middle of the night and I was like, man. We can't just throw <laughs> these fees into fee distribution. We need to do something else with them. Oh, that's funny. That's great. Um, this one's kind of interesting. What about the 100 million that Tendermint plans to give out to the early contributors? Is there a chance to blow a part of that into marketing Atom in the Cosmos ecosystem? Yeah, that's a great question, crypto space. And the very short answer is absolutely not. Yeah. Um, you know, those atoms are contractually bound by a number of things. There's a lot going on kind of behind the scenes there. I think it's really great that Tendermint is actually doing this. Um, Tendermint has this huge treasury of atom and there's various claims on it. Clearing those will help Tendermint focus more clearly on its mission um, and also value align a lot of early developers who for various reasons have basically not received any atom. Um, so that is kind of incentive aligned people to go out there and build their own chains and kind of work within the ecosystem while not working on the hub. So I do think that the atom that Tendermint is distributing to early developers and early employees at Tendermint will do better to drive work and drive value back to the hub. Um, in a in a unique way that is very different from doing that um, via liquidity provision. So, um, crypto space MBA um, appreciate your question. <laughs> He's like, oh yeah, I get it. Great. <laughs> um, someone's talking about burning. I guess will there be something similar to EIP fifteen fifty nine for Adam? Um, yeah, so the Ethermint team actually has an implementation of EIP-1559 uh, for Cosmos SDK. So uh, it's up to Atom holders to decide whether or not we want that. Um, I'm personally in favor of a better fee mechanism. You know, chains like Terra and Osmosis and the Hub are starting to run into the current limitations of the Atom fee system. Um, there's a lot of discussions going on about that. I'd love to see somebody push up a governance proposal to... Uh, move that work forward on the hub. Um, I know that some folks on the Tendermint team and some folks on the informal team are primarily working on that right now, um, in addition to the Ethermint folks and Terra, which is obviously extremely interested in that as well. So uh, deep props. Um, will there be something similar? There will be a reorganization of the fee structure. Exactly what that looks like is TBD. Cool. Spot on. Um, let's kind of talk about the proposal 56 a little more. Yeah. Um, how do you envision, how do you envision the, the way that it works being tied into the future of the hub, um, potentially with interchain security and the bridge already on there? Uh, do you, do you expect the, the module to like, need a lot of upgrades in the future or is this something that's going to like work seamlessly with interchain security yeah this is something that works seamlessly with interchain security it's a really dumb feature like um the way that it works and let me just kind of maybe i pull up a little uh um, ventures ibc go request I have a sort of visual representation of what this looks like. So I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen if you don't mind. Yeah, perfect. Um, welcome to my desktop. It's a mess here. Um, so IBC go packet forwarding. There it is. So uh, here is that example. And this is 
an example going from Luna to Osmosis through the hub, because, you know, why not pick a bunch of exciting projects to make an example out of? <laughs> um, and over on Terra, when you, you know, you're clicking your ledger and you're sending your uh, message transfer, um, the wallet would fill in two addresses into the receiver field, as well as some information about the forwarding uh, that is additional to just the individual address. And when this packet goes from Terra to the hub, what the hub is going to do is use this Cosmos address as sort of a redeem address in the case of packet failure. So if the packet fails to get relayed, you would be left on the Cosmos hub at this address, which is you know an address you control because the wallet makes sure that you control that key. And then we say, we'd like to put those funds down the transfer channel 144 over to Osmosis and deposit those funds into this Osmosis address. Um, the hub will receive that packet. And when it processes it, instead of depositing those funds into the receiver address, it creates an outgoing packet and manipulates the sender and receiver field. This intermediate address becomes the sender and the final destination address becomes the receiver and the denomination turns into the IBC denomination on the hub for Luna over that channel that it traveled over and the amount is the same and then this packet gets sent over to osmosis and then when it's accepted over there the user has the tokens over on osmosis and this happens with users just having to send one transaction so this feature does work in concert with every other IBC feature. And it is a really simple piece of machinery that is going to be very easy to maintain and very easy to upgrade. It is intended to be the first multi-hop routing protocol. There are a lot of designs for much more complicated, much more capable, much more error tolerant routing protocols that will be able to do much longer multi-hop routes across a number of other um, protocol, uh, across a number of different protocols, not just token transfer that will end up getting added. And maybe this feature falls into disuse after a while, once those more advanced ones come online. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have designed this feature to be extremely lightweight, very easy to adopt, very easy to, um, and, and very easy to uh, upgrade to, to newer features. So uh, I hope that answers that question. I think so. Um, cool. We actually do have some follow-up questions about 56. Yeah. I see in, some great follow-up questions here. This yeah, yeah. Uh, so in current, current fee-less form, Prop 56 will add additional burdens to relayers while they are not compensated right now. Do you think a meaningful portion of the IBC fees will go to the relayers in the future? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we do have an IBC middleware piece. So the way that I've implemented this is as a piece of IBC middleware. Anyone who is familiar with sort of tech from the 90s it was aware of the middleware craze um, of the 1990s. And this was with the original routers. And I think we're going to go see a uh, middleware craze in IBC as well. Um, uh, but there is a fee middleware. Um, and this is the ability to pass in a fee, both for relaying acknowledgements and uh, things. I can share a link to that here, but this will substantially incentivize relayers. And uh, especially with wallet pickup, I, I do see a huge chunk of uh, fees being paid to relayers. And I do see relaying being a profitable activity sometime within the next six to nine months. Um, there's a reason... Uh, there's a reason I run relayers, and that's because uh, I do think it's going to be a great business. Um, so I think that answers that question. Um, did that? Did I get that? You think? Yeah, I think basically not right now, but it definitely will in the future. Like in short, that's the answer, right? Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, Let's yeah, let's let's one. tackle that one. Can you talk about the concerns Thorchain have with IBC incentives, and when can we expect other projects trying to make their own version of IBC? 
Yes, yeah, so crypto space, great question. There's already a ton of other projects trying to make their own version of LBC. And in fact, most of them just read the IBC spec and just try to re-implement it. A great example of that is Orbital, which is IBC. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think that, first off, I just want to say, I'm in discussions with the Thor team about this, actively trying to answer those questions and concerns that they have about IBC. Um, I, I think that I've substantially resolved those with the team and, and we'd like to move forward there. Um, so I, I don't think, first off, I think a lot of their concerns are kind of overblown. Um, a. B, I think that the incentives for relayers are plenty strong for now. And we have incoming fully on chain incentives for relayers, which will fix this problem in the long term. So I think that those fears are slightly overblown. Um, you know, they have their own version of techn bridging technology that is very similar to IBC in a lot of ways. Um, but especially for proof of work chains, does require a bit more heavyweight infrastructure. I built a similar system with Gravity Bridge. So I'm very, very familiar with the different trade offs between these systems. Um, I think that IBC is a much more lightweight protocol than Bifrost. Um, and it's going to allow ThorChain to bring in a lot more assets very quickly. So uh, can you talk about the concerns ThorChain has with IBC incentives? I hope I've addressed those. Um, and then can we expect other projects trying to make their own version of IBC? They're all gonna try. But the thing is, is that we have the center of gravity here. It's continuing to grow in new projects that are looking for interoperability see the stellar production record, the formal verification of IBC and the large number of copycats, and they're gonna want the real deal. And you know we're seeing that over and over again. So I hope that answers that question. I think so. Um, John D follows up with a, when can we expect relayer incentives and how do you imagine that affecting the relayer ecosystem? Yeah, John, um, when can we expect relayer incentives? Three to six months uh, deployed fully on chain within three to uh, within six to nine months. Um, you know, obviously with any kind of IBC upgrade, it takes a long time for it to roll out over all of the IBC connected chains because of the way the fee incentives work and because it fixes a, a, a sort of issue with IBC that, that folks have. Um, I do foresee that getting rolled out relatively quickly. Um, it's a very easy thing to add to a chain. Um, Another note about the fee incentives is that if one chain has them enabled and another one doesn't, relayers will still get paid, just potentially a little bit less. So uh, I do see this relayer incentives thing um, increasing the number of relayers. You know, obviously when there's money directly involved as opposed to more indirectly involved the way it is now, more folks are interested. Um, but I do see the folks that it sort of adopt relaying early and start doing it now as being the winners in that ecosystem because they will have a huge head start on the folks that only show up when the money starts flowing. Um, you know, over at Strange Love, we're working very hard to bring the Go Relayer back up to uh, production status. Um, our friends over at Notional are really helping us with that effort. Um, and as part of that, we're building out uh, infrastructure to support uh, publicly available archive nodes for people who want to play around with relayers in rebuilding or getting started experience around relaying on production networks. So I think the combination of relayer incentives and better tooling and getting started experiences for relayers will create a huge number of folks doing this within the ecosystem. Definitely. All right, Gustavo is back. He wants to know, he says that you mentioned before that the current blockchains like Osmosis will most likely not use the router. Why do you see that being the case? Huh. What was the question? Sorry, I missed that. Uh, you mentioned before that current blockchains like Osmosis will most likely not use the router. Why do you see that being the case? Yeah, well, Osmosis specifically, I'm relying on the public statements of Sonny, um, who has said that he believes that the network will be more point to point. Um, also, networks that have gone through the pain to sort of set up all these connections already have a great deal of experience with IBC at this point, much more than other folks. Um, so they are much more able to moving forward to continue to support that. 
Um, I do see a point at which Osmosis, Osmosis has always said it wants to buy interchain services from the hub, including shared security. I do see a point at which Osmosis does use some form of packet routing from the hub um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, but, you know, the reason I'm saying that is because of what Sonny has said and, and his desire not to adopt this feature. Fair enough. Crypto space is bringing up the versioning. Crypto space, excellent question. Versioning is a hobby horse of mine. Um, I don't think we're changing it from bad to worse. I think we're acknowledging. The, so is the Cosmos SDK 1.0? Gaia Hub's at 5.0. Terra's at some .o. Kava's at a bunch of .o's. Like, this is a 1.0 piece of software and has been for a number of years. I pushed for 1.0 when we launched the hub and I figured, hey, we're launching a production version of this thing. It should be 1.0. The Tenderman team is extremely conservative with versioning and has not cut a 1.0 yet. That has sort of fallen over into the SDK. Um, the proposal from the Tenderman team that I saw out today basically uh, says, let's recognize what's happened. These are major versions. Let's start calling them major versions and let's just remove the zero dot off of the front of them and make the versions that going forward. I think this is a great idea. It fixes a lot of software lifecycle issues and it acknowledges that these versions of the Cosmos SDK we're shipping are major production versions and it makes Simver work the way it's supposed to. I'm hugely in support of that proposal and happy to support the Tendermint team in that. Thank you to the Tendermint team for pushing that. Yeah, I think Alessio is pretty proud about it. Alessio DM'd me about it this morning. He was so excited. This is something Alessio <laughs> and I have talked about a number of times in person as well as online. And I'm happy to see him fighting the good fight on this. So he'll be in support of that. Um, what happened to Prop 55? Wasn't it like Kusama is for Polkadot, a real testnet for the hub? I would have liked that. Yeah, what are your thoughts on Prop 55, the canary chain, I guess you could call it? I'm really against this for a wide number of reasons. Um, yeah. I think Kusama has been great for Cosmos, by the way. Um, notice I didn't say Kusama has been great for Polkadot. Um, <laughs> Polkadot launched essentially a carbon copy of what their production chain was and in the process gave it a huge amount of value and it has essentially become a second production chain. The amount of effort, time, software support, user support that is required to support one production blockchain is massive. Creating a canary chain that also has value, doubles that effort, makes it much harder for the organization to focus on the core blockchain that it should be focusing on, i.e. Polkadot, um, and slows things down by a matter of years. The fact that we have not had a canary chain has allowed us to ship much faster. And I think that that's really important. Now, test nets are important. I, I've obviously been a huge proponent of those. I think we should continue, we do continue to do those. Um, but I don't think that having some sort of artificial canary chain to enable more people to gamble on the value of an ecosystem is a great idea. I'd rather people just spin up other blockchains, which is, oh wait, what we've seen happen. There's many, many copies of the Cosmos SDK across many different versions, all running in production and all supporting millions and millions of dollars of value. So we have canary chains, but we don't have the burden of a canary chain. And I think that's really important. Fair enough. Zaki Manian has said in a previous interview that the inflationary words for Adam staking could be changed in a way to reduce inflation or potentially cause Adam to be deflationary. Do you have any information on that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Zucky and I work really closely together. So this is something I've heard Zucky talk about quite a few times. Um, if you live in the US, um, staking rewards are counted as income. And as you can imagine, earning income in a highly volatile token that is taxed at time of receipt is a really painful process. So there's a lot of incentive for folks to sort of figure out a different way to do this. I think staking derivatives, which is the work that Zaki is doing right now for the hub, um, addresses this issue in a couple of different ways. 
Um, so I would encourage folks to go kind of follow the latest of the staking derivative work. Hey, Tariq. Hey. Um, I would encourage folks to kind of follow the latest on that staking derivative work. Um, but other than that, I, I do think it's, um, other than that, there's always been the idea of, Oh, I come back. Oh, here's okay. the key card for entering next to the building. Uh, you don't have to lock the door. Okay. I'll be back in an hour. I gotta do major work. All right. I might be gone. Uh, you might be gone. So yeah. I'll leave that key card in. I'll make sure to leave it here. But then, how do you get it? Here, you yeah. take it. <laughs> All right. All right. Cool. I might see you when you get back. Um, Hold on a second. I love you, man. <laughs> <laughs> This is Tariq from Savo, yeah. Um we're, we're, we're launching Mainnet today, too, so we, we got a lot going on. Um, but, it's exciting. Uh, yeah, it is. It is exciting. Um, I just want to see this network making heartbeats. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, on the deflationary side, I've, I've heard a number of folks bat around an idea of something called a demurrage-based currency. And this would essentially be a deflationary by design currency where stakers just retain value and all unstaked tokens lose value slowly over time. So instead of depositing staking rewards into accounts, we would actually reduce the balance of accounts. Now, um, this idea seems cool in theory. However, uh, every time I've talked to any exchange or sort of a traditional finance person about this idea, they look at me like I'm crazy. I've grown five heads and they say, I don't know how to build tooling that accounts for reduction in balances. Um, and they get real scared. So I, I think that there's a lot of, uh, you know, barriers in people's minds to a currency like that. I'd love to see somebody launch a demurrage based proof of stake network. I think that would be fascinating. Um, I don't think we see that on the hub anytime soon. I would see deflation coming from a mechanism like EIP 15519 much sooner than sort of uh, deflationary atom from a structural standpoint. Do you think that answers the question? Yeah, more or less. <laughs> um, so I think we've reached the end of the questions. Oh, um, well, this, you know, Johnny, do you have any questions for me? Can be anything, <laughs> can be, can be non-Prop 56 related. I mean, are you done talking about Prop, about Prop 56? I'm always I'm always down to talk Prop 56, so we can talk more Prop 56 if you'd like. I, I just I don't know how much more material there is to cover. It's only like a couple. Like, I mean, realistically, the lines yeah. are small. So small, <laughs> small piece of code does a lot. Yeah. Um, sure. I mean, I guess if you want to talk about, uh, I'd actually like to know a little bit about Somalia. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, you know. Somalia is something I've been working on now for about nine months. Um, it's a really exciting project for a number of reasons. Oh, I hope this is not awful. Okay, great, that's fine. Um, so uh, Somalia uh, has been in the works for a while, but the core of the idea was I, I started working on the Gravity Bridge back last November, December. And, uh, you know, Althea had the contract to bring that to the hub, but Zucky and I and uh, Tariq, who you guys just saw on the stream, started talking about, okay, well, if we were to deploy the gravity bridge, how could we derive value from that? And how could we get people to use this bridge? Because there's plenty of bridges to nowhere out there. And mm -hmm. I think that a lot of times there's a bridge without a reason. Um, it's just like, oh, cool. This is a cool technical thing we can do. So like, let's build a bridge. Um, so we kind of quickly came across the idea of using cross-chain contract calls, i.e. originating Ethereum transactions over on the Cosmos side and sending them over to Ethereum as a way to manage complex state on Ethereum that is hard to manage in another way. And we sort of zeroed in on Uniswap. And especially since the transition to Uniswap v3, which requires a lot more activity from liquidity providers, um, we yeah. built a product, we're in the middle of building and shipping a product uh, that basically watches liquidity in a Uniswap v3 pool and rebalances it to a new price range based on the vote of validators over on the Cosmos side. 
So uh, this technology has the, the ability to deploy to any EVM blockchain. I've deployed the Gravity Bridge to Phantom. I've deployed it to Polygon. I know it works with these other networks as well. Um, and there's a lot of different places for us to deploy this sort of contract management um, and sort of decentralized management of state on these smart contracting platforms. Being able to use the same technology for osmosis being able to use the same technology across other blockchains within IBC. Um, and the way that Sommelier will drive revenue to SOM holders is by charging for these products that it manages. We have zero inflation on the SOM chain and there's a fixed supply for the token. So uh, the only way that those token holders will be seeing revenues is as a result of the products that we're managing. So, you know, as a financial product, the SOM holders would take sort of a management fee or a performance fee um, from these various DeFi products. Those would then filter back to the SOM chain and be distributed to SOM holders. Interesting. So, I mean, a lot a lot of working with the bridge, working with Sommelier kind of ties in with like Prop 56 and uses for the hub. So it's all sort of synergistic. Yeah, you know, I, I've been like, I love this ecosystem. I'm not going to lie. I, I, I came into it back in 2018 and I've made not only incredible friends, but, but great business partners. And I've, I've worked hard to sort of like as a crew, as a squad, you know, to uh, sort of help lift all boats and, you know, pursue this community focused strategy. And that involves you know, contributing to a lot of different projects and making sure that the things that you're working on um, touch a number of different projects. And, you know, Gravity Bridge is definitely one of those. This idea of the hub as a router is one of those. And, you know, all those folks who are out there kind of deploying zones and, you know, learning about IBC and learning about this new cross-chain world that we, were, we are all living in, um, you know, I, I try to build for those folks. Definitely. Um, it looks like oh. maybe, yeah, there it is. That's a great question. <laughs> when can we expect the return of the bow tie? <laughs> That's a great question, Rudy. You just, you, you, I, I, I got to bring the boat back soon. I have been um, moving for a lot of the last year. Uh, my wife and I moved out of the Bay Area and we were sort of looking for a place for a while and, and we've recently settled. Um, so my bow ties have been in storage for a while, which is why you haven't seen them. Um, they are now out of storage and I need to start putting them out again. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, one more question on prop 56. Uh, if the cosmos hub became a router and there are millions of blockchains in the future, will the hub be able to withstand the ridiculous amount of IBC transactions expected? Yes. There is a large, so. Um, you know, what we have focused on at Tendermint is safety over liveness. These are like, I'm going to throw out some terms and like, I don't want folks to like misinterpret those. These, these are like consensus engineering terms and like, you know, like random engineering terms. Um, we have focused on safety over liveness and we have focused on features over performance. Um, there is so much, like, I cannot stress this so much low hanging performance fruit within this entire stack that there's enough work for a team of 10 performance engineers for two years to go in and optimize various layers of this stack. As we start seeing increased uh, volume and we start seeing traffic issues, the natural response to that is to pursue some of that low hanging performance engineering fruit. That work is already starting. We're seeing huge jumps in performance already over the last few upgrades. We're gonna continue to see those. The hub will scale performance in line with demand. Um, Spot on. Can we get to Gustavo's question? Yeah. What about Cosmo funding projects for value accrual like Jacob has suggested? Yes. So uh, the Tendermint team is working closely on this. Um, if you've seen what they've been working on with Starport, you can imagine a combination of Starport, cross-chain security, and hub routing where the community pool can participate in um, funding of new projects, as well as helping them bootstrap their entry into the IBC ecosystem is a huge way to accrue value for Atom holders. 
I foresee this moving forward. And, you know, I, I don't know what the latest from the Tinderman team is, but that's very, very exciting. More questions coming. Is there a diagram that shows the IBC data transfer for the different components like the zones, router, and relayers? That's a great question. You know, when I was at Tendermint, Pong had a few really cool diagrams that showed how packets sort of traveled through the SDK state machine across channels onto other zones. Um, I would encourage you to look at that. But I think now is a great time for anyone who is interested to sort of draw up one of those diagrams and sort of publish it. It's going to be a great way to get views and clicks. Um, so if anyone's interested in that, I'm happy to help them do that. And I know there's a number of other folks in the ecosystem who love diagrams and can't draw them, um, but love to talk about this stuff. So if you're interested, please hit one of us up. Spot on. Um, CryptoSpace wants to know, on the fix testing with 900 validators, is there a possibility we could see that on the hub? I mean, the hub can support that many validators. We just increased the number of validators. I don't, you know, we're seeing stakes slowly decentralize. You know, there's these exchange validators, which are getting large, but there's also, you know, a lot of effort to sort of support some smaller validators. I think that, you know, right now the hub supports a good number of validators. I don't really see a huge reason to increase that number. Um, you know, if you want to go to governance and give it a try, the software will support it. So, you know, could we see that on the hub? Yeah, sure. I don't see why not. It's a possibility. Yeah, it's a possibility. Yeah. Um, I think we're pretty much there, Jack. Awesome. Well, that's yeah. good. Is there anything, any last closing comments you want to throw out? Yeah, I want to go back to Prop 34 and Prop 46. Um, you know, okay. I, we, this community here has, has supported me and my work for a really long time. And I just want to give folks a quick update on Prop 34 and Prop 46. Um, at the beginning of this year, going into this bull market, you know, there was a lot of disarray, especially in the marketing pieces of the organization and the number of folks working on marketing within the broader cosmos and the amount of money dedicated to that was relatively small. Um, Prop 34 aimed to step in and provide an initial funding to get to kickstart a marketing organization across a number of different into kickstart collaboration across all of the different ecosystem projects, as well as folks on the team. Um, Johnny Adriana from your team really stepped up in a huge way and helped us lead that. We had some folks, um, Joe Dierte, AKA Drew, um, Drew Beauty, who is on your team as well. Um, also were, has stepped up in a huge way to help out um, Garrett from the region, an investor over in region, as well as a number of other folks have done a great job. We did the initial report for Prop 34 when we put up Prop 46, and we showed some huge results. Um, we've kind of continued to spend down that fund, and we're close to the end of that, and we'll be closing out that Prop 34, 46 effort here very soon. Um, and the purpose that we've set, which is to sort of buy time for the larger organizations to develop their marketing orgs and to increase spend there, I think has gone swimmingly. You know, um, we're seeing Adam with greater exposure in the broader crypto discussion than ever before. I, I think that you know Prop Thirty Four can take uh, some credit for that, but you know the growth of the various organizations and the marketing departments there, and the growth of their spend there has been impressive. And, uh, you know, I just want to say thank you to everyone who voted for that. And I, I, I hope you guys see that we've taken those funds and done something awesome with them. Um, and it, it's, it's been, that, that's been a really cool experience this year. You know, it, there's a lot of people who talk about DAOs and the Cosmos Hub is one of the largest and best functioning DAOs in the entire crypto space. And we never talk about it as one. So uh, yeah, that, that's, uh, I think a big, victory for the hub and, and something that's worked great. True. Do, do, do. do you want to keep going? <laughs> yeah. Dude, oh, as always, I love this AMA stuff. This is great. All right. Um, Gustavo wants to know about that investment uh, Terra made. Yeah. 
you know, Terra has long been a consumer of the Cosmos SDK and a number of other Cosmos technologies. They have obviously been focused on sort of bootstrapping their core audience, and that's great. Uh, they've now grown the platform to the point where they can really significantly invest in the underlying infrastructure that they uh, that they use. It is great to see that it, it warms my heart and, you know, gives me confidence that, you know, this project that we're doing isn't just niche. Like there's other projects that build on it. They're contributing back. It's great to see it. I, I talked to Doe about it this week yeah. um, and, and offered some support from my side and like, Love to see that from Terra. I think it's hugely bullish for the whole ecosystem. It's like paying them, paying it back and paying it forward. Yeah. yeah. Um, the question about exchanges and governance, um, I think there's yeah. a number of things we can do there initially. And just right now, we can reduce the amount of quorum required. There's long been a proposal to do uh, sort of a separate delegation for governance voting i.e. you could have sort of a governator or some account that you would delegate your governance vote to. That's one way of handling this exchange validator problem. Um, but I'm confident in the Cosmos Hub's ability to continue shipping advanced governance tooling that enables us to work through and around these issues. So thank you for the question, TK. Jack, what's your favorite dog breed? German Shepherds. I have a uh, two-year-old half German Shepherd. Um, she's great. Her name is Gypsy. Um, I absolutely love dogs. And, you know, I, I, I'm not super choosy about breeds. <laughs> I love Labs. I love Goldens. Um, I have a lot of friends right now with various forms of like Border Collies and Cattle Dogs. Um, which I really like a lot. I'm a huge, I love hiking and, and being outdoors. And, and I think especially for, uh, for that, it's, it's great to hike with, uh, you know, some, some sort of cattle dog or uh, herding, sporting dog. Um, I see Danielle is very sad about that. My <laughs> wife is allergic to cats. Otherwise I would have a ton of cats. I grew up with all black cats, weirdly enough. Um, so love cats too. <laughs> Awesome, Jack. Thanks for being here, man. This is yeah, awesome. Yeah, well, Johnny, thank you for organizing. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you for uh, sort of dealing with me showing up at the very last minute. I appreciate oh, that. No, we made it happen. We made it happen. <laughs> oh, yeah, we did. Um, do, do, do. One of the narratives of Cosmos Eco is application-specific blockchains. How do you think that will adjust with Etherman and Juno launching? Ethermin and Juno are controversially application-specific blockchains. Their applications are WASM and the EVM. And having smart contracting capability within the Cosmos is one of the most bullish things to happen in this ecosystem in a very long time. And I think when you see the combination of what happens with IBC and application and uh, broadly programmable blockchains like Juno, we're going to see an explosion in different financial products across the ecosystem that are going to be available to the folks on the base chains. And I think that is absolutely wonderful. Um, crypto space, um, there will be many other opportunities to bombard me with questions. And Johnny, maybe we should just start doing this more regularly. Uh, yeah, we're actually hoping to do that, actually. Um, this was a sort of a testing format. Um, hopefully, we can put this on YouTube after yeah. we've, after we're done recording um but yeah let's do it let's do it more great let's do it next month <laughs> okay okay october Octo mid mid october it's a plan awesome great well uh johnny thank you and uh to everyone here thank you very much as well uh appreciate uh appreciate folks coming and listening and, and hopefully you got something out of this yeah thanks guys awesome thank you